So our guest this evening has taught more people to think than Australia in history. He shared the platform with presidents and princes, prime ministers and captains of industry and has inspired thousands of audiences in over 20 countries around the world. He's not only Australia's best-selling business author of Multiply Your Business by 10, which I have that book here tonight. Um, he's also written and software for your brain, but he's also a cognitive scientist acknowledged as a world authority in lateral thinking. He was a co-founder of the School of Thinking with Edward de Bono in New York, where he was based for 14 years and where the United States government described him as a national asset. Our guest has been an international consultant of strategic thinking to who's who of the world's movers and shakers. And his advice has been sought by leaders like Jack Welsh of General Electric and by organisations from the United Nations, the White House, the US State Department of IBM, Coca-Cola, ANZ, University of Melbourne and Newcrest Mining. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to please, please warmly thank uh, for his time, Dr. Michael Hewitt Gleeson. Thanks, Tom. Uh, it's not a bad introduction, was it? I, I wrote it myself, so I think it's, a, it's based on fact. Um, well, look, thanks very much. It's really great fun for me to be here. I've already met some great people, and uh, Melbourne's a great town, and spring is in the air. I've just moved into the CBD recently, so I was able to just take a walk down uh, Elizabeth Street and, uh, and then rock up to a place like this, so, so life is good, huh? Although I just spent a month in Italy and La Dolce Vita there is not, not, not bad either. I learned, a new <laughs> I learned a new skill while I was there, how to drink grappa at lunchtime. But uh, they, um, you know, they got rid of Berlusconi and then they've got Monty in there and uh, Monty's doing all the right things. You know, he's tightening the belt and putting up the retirement age and doing all the things to get, try to get Italy ship shape again. And uh, they've had enough of that already so they said bring back Berlusconi. They're all trying to get Berlusconi back. I'm not sure if it's the bunker bunker parties or what it is, but anyway. But uh, anyway, here we are in Melbourne, the most livable city in the world, and uh, and uh, life is good. So that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I uh, Eli had asked me what to uh, call the talk tonight, so I called it "Should Professionals Think?" because he said this group is young professionals. Melbourne Young Professionals or something like that. So I thought, should professionals think? So I hope at some point during the talk I touch on that subject. Um, but uh, it's an interesting question. I mean, let me just ask you, should professionals think? Yes. Yes, okay. I, I, was <laughs> I was once asked, asked to give a talk out at Monash Medical Centre, so I called the talk, Should Doctors Think? And that filled the theatre with a group of doctors with their arms folded and their frowning faces. And the, but we got through the talk and they, they got the message and they liked it. But it is a legitimate question. And the reason it's a legitimate question is that um, some things we just take for granted and we probably assume that professionals do think. And although there's not a lot of evidence uh, to support that. but um, uh, and, uh, and so since we assume that, we don't need to do anything about it. So it's a question worth asking whatever answer, whatever conclusion you come to because thinking is not something to take for granted. It's pretty important. Uh, I came up, I'll, go, so I'll give you a little bit of background and then I'll talk a little bit and then we'll have, you know, we'll, we'll interact. Um, so when I was a bit younger than most of you, they had a, a raffle in, in Australia and they put uh, 366 marbles into a barrel, one for every possible day of the year, and then they'd pull out the marbles and uh, if you're, you were born on that particular date that they pulled out, you won at all expenses paid two years in the army. It was during the Vietnam era, it was called National Service. And they pulled out 22nd of May, and it's the only raffle I've ever won in my life. But, uh, and as they said in those days, join the army, get trained up, get kitted out, um, travel the world, go to exotic places, meet interesting people and kill them. And, uh, <laughs> So it was a strange era, um, and there was a lot of mixed feelings. Uh, but I was in charge of all the beer in Vietnam, so I figured I was the safest guy in the army. You can see it's had no effect on, on, on my physique. But anyway, it was a very interesting era, and one of the things it did do is it made us think. And uh, it made us think in a way that we'd never really thought before. We were certainly stimulated in a way that we'd never been stimulated before. We were trained in a way that um, in extraordinary type of training, put into a situation which was pretty remarkable. And 
Um, and so we began, to, many of us just began to think really for the first time, think about things that we'd never thought of before. Uh, and one of the big things that happened is they had the Paris Peace Talks and Kissinger and Le Duc To and uh, all of the brilliant geniuses, their entourage, their you know, lawyers, you know, brilliant people and, and you know, huge uh, retinues from both the Americans and the Vietnamese went to Paris to sue for peace. And we were all about 20 years of age, young soldiers. So we thought, well, that's great. The, the wise uh, people who brought us here are now going to bring us home because they're going to sue for peace. And so, so we'll be home for Christmas. Well, we weren't home for Christmas. Now, you probably won't <laughs> believe this story. I don't think there's anyone old enough to remember. But the good thing about Google is you can check up anything I say. Um, uh, we weren't home for Christmas because they spent seven months arguing over the shape of the table at the peace talks. So when I say, should professionals think, it actually is a very reasonable question. Um, you can imagine the impact that had on us and our morale, even, even unsophisticated young 20-year-olds that didn't know much about the world. One thing we did know was that the price that we were paying for that discussion was far too high, far too high. And that um, it, you know, we began to think things like, if it's going to take them seven months to figure out the shape of the table, how long will it take them to figure out rather more complex and important matters. And we see many situations around the world that have gone on for years and years and years and hundreds of years even, and even in some cases thousands of years. It's not that the problems can't be solved in themselves, but they just can't be solved with the kind of thinking that is be currently being used. And so again, and these people may be experts, they may be highly educated, they may be highly articulate, highly intelligent, and people of goodwill, and yet the systems they're, they're using, the processes they're using, are just not getting the job done. So there's a big disappointment in really. Um, we look recently at things like, uh, I was going to say September 11, but just 2008, uh, you know, the re recent financial. Quite dramatic. And really, uh, people, uh, to me, what's new about this recent uh, period is that people not only know that the experts don't know what they're doing, because clearly they don't, because <laughs> clearly um, these outcomes are not what we had in mind. But, but we, kn we know that they don't know what they're doing. And they know that we know that they don't know what they're doing. And I think that's the first time that's ever happened. So that's very interesting. Um, I used to think when I was a young guy, you know, that if you just got out of their way, the wise people in Canberra, you know, or Melbourne University or Harvard or Washington, often men with beards, you know, they'll take care of the world. They'll fix everything because they know what they're doing. They're experts. They're professionals. So just get out of their way and then they'll fix everything and we can just get on with our lives. But uh, that's not the way it works. My uh, uh, examiner for my PhD was George Gallup, Professor Gallup who invented market research and the Gallup Poll at Princeton, which was a scientific way of measuring public opinion um, and a way of actually getting a real bottom-up power to the people, power to the customer. Before Gallup, Henry Ford could say things like, you know, you can have any color you want as long as it's in black when he built the, the Ford. But after Gallup measuring public opinion, no marketer, no uh, political candidate would go into the marketplace without making some scientific effort to measure the opinions of the people. And so that was a dramatic, it's probably the, the greatest act of democracy ever performed by any scientist was to invent that, that concept. And uh, he told me an interesting thing. So I'm going to drop a couple of names and mention two quotes which underline this theme of should professionals think. George said you can't expect leaders to change things. He said they're the last person in the world that will change things because it's not intelligent behavior for a leader to foster change. Because why would they upset set the very status quo that gives them their leadership position? Leaders are leaders of a particular status quo. And so it's not in their intelligent uh, bubble, in their logic bubble, to be the ones to pull the rug out from under their own feet and to change the situation which they lead. So why could we, how could we reasonably expect leaders to change things? It's got to bubble up. It's got to come from the bottom up. Now, there are exceptions. And I met, we did, did quite a lot of work with one of them, Jack Welch, um, you know, during the 80s. Uh, my agent, I was living in New York at the time. I lived there for quite a long while went for a weekend, and I stayed 15 years. But um, uh, that was the 80s, <laughs> the good old days. But anyway, I digress, um, having flashbacks. Um, but I, I, was, uh, I was there, and I was invited to, an uh, agent booked me to talk to GE, to a group like this, 
their operations managers meeting. It was down in Florida, so I went down, I did my talk. And I used to write, a, I often could do a talk where I used multiplied by 10. So I, I write up on the board G, E, X, 10. That's, that's on this book here. So G, X, 10. So I write, that's one of the techniques that we teach, multiplying by 10. So G e by 10, what if you multiply G e by 10? Now at the time in the early 80s, uh, manufacturing was tough, it was going through tough times like now. Uh, G e was a huge manufacturer, 100 year old, huge, huge, vast monolithic bureaucratic, you know, silo type of operation. I mean, enormous, making everything from locomotives to nuclear weapons to, uh, you know, in, uh, aircraft engines, the light bulbs, pop-up toasters, you name it, huge. And uh, Jack just took over as chairman. In fact, he was sitting in the front row and I was giving my talk, you know, and so on, and I taught a particular technique, which I'll teach you. And uh, he leapt on the platform after my talk. He said, this is what we've got to do to this company. Multiply it bit by 10. I want to, at that stage, it was a $35 billion manufacturer. And, um, and, uh, and I use this thing, you know, multi multiply things by 10, we'll come to it in a minute. And he said after the talk, he said, how are you getting back to New York? I said, well, I've got my ticket. He said, no, no, come back with me. So going back with the chairman in tail, going out to the airport with that a fleet of aircraft, they had a huge, uh, um, what were they called, what were the big ones called? You know, two Learjets and another big something star, I forget what, the, what it was called. And we were actually sitting in the plane, eating lobster and drinking French champagne on the way back to New York. And again, I'm having flashbacks because that doesn't happen anymore. I've still got corporate clients, but you don't get lobster anymore. But anyway, uh, <laughs> at least I can say it happened. But uh, more importantly, we were talking, he said, I'd like to get this throughout the whole company. He said, if I, you know, if I could get everyone in the, in the company, which is going to be about half the size of what it is now by the time I finish with it, because I'm going to try and make it a much smaller company. But he said, if I could get everyone thinking, you know, the road to the, to the BVS, the better view of the situation, the multiplied by 10 view of the situation. He said, could you help me? I said, yeah, sure, that's what I do. So I spent about three or four years with him as a client going around to the whole GE organization. And, and uh, at one point they had uh, this little soft brain software, I'll give you in a second, up on every office in every factory in the whole GE world. And of course you know the story, Jack, Jack was a great leader. He did this, he would have done it anyway, but he uses various consultants to help him. And by the time he left GE, he'd multiplied it 4,000% and it was the most valuable company in the history of the world. He left his shareholders with a terrific result. He streamlined, uh, streamlined it, made it a much smaller company, and uh, sh shows and really, really used. He often used to complain, said the media, media have never understood how I've used training. He was very, very big on training, where most cor corporations have training, but they don't pay attention at board level. He said how I use that to change the culture of GE. And they had a big, uh, their own training academy out near West Point at Crotonville on Hudson. And he would actually go out there quite regularly, is to call him Professor Jack, and work with his senior executives, training them on his various philosophies and the things he wanted to do. And, uh, you know, you often you'll see uh, big corporations in America especially have these big training facilities. And the chairman might visit, like a state visit once in a while and, you know, you know, bless everything and then leave, but not really take it seriously as a strategic um, opportunity for changing the culture of the organization, but he did, and uh, and uh, I guess you know the story. Anyway, so what I thought I'd do, a little bit of background, I just wanted to drop a few names, so justify my position at the front here, but um, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I want to personalize this a bit. So I've got five questions here. And the answer to these questions are either yes or no. So I'll ask the question, and then I'll say, those who say yes, then just put up your hand. Those who know, get the idea. Okay, so the first question is this. When situations arise, can you instantly know how you feel about them? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, okay. Uh, no. Okay, uh, anyone doesn't have an opinion? So try and play, okay, try and play. Okay, um, do you find it easy to see the logical errors in the thinking of others? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, no. Okay. Okay, and uh, are you good at convincing others when your point of view is right? Yes. Okay. Ah, now we're doing, okay. No. Okay, and... Uh, do you find it easy, sorry, when your opinions are criticized, can you quickly defend them? Yes. No. Okay. 
your idea. When faced with a decision, can you quickly see the obvious alternatives and then choose the best one? Yes. Okay. No. Thank you. Um, if you answered yes to any of those questions, then chances are your thinking is not as fast as it might be and, and much, much slower and it may, could even raise the question, are you thinking at all? And that's, <laughs> and that's my talk, uh, that's why my talk is Should Professionals Think? Um, obviously, I sort of rigged the questions a little bit to get the effect I want, but that's all I wanted was an effect to give you something to think about. Um, because what I'm going to discuss with you, what do we really mean when we say thinking? And I don't think it's widely understood. And, and uh, what is the main problem with our thinking in, 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 in this room, in this society, in this culture, in the Western society? It varies in other cultures, of course, because they don't share the same cognitive history that we, that we have. And uh, uh, how serious is the problem? Um, and then what can we do about it? But we are, in fact, very, very slow thinkers. Um, if, if we take a position, OK, what's the main purpose of the brain? As an organ, the brain's an organ of the body, and the various organs of the body do different things. The brain, um, by, by a lot of people may not know, the brain is actually the largest sex organ of the body. Not in my case, but for many people, I just. <laughs> now you may as well laugh, my jokes don't get any better than that. Okay. But um, the brain uh, is the largest sex organ of the body. It's a very important organ of the body. It's our survival organ. It's, our, it's the organ that allows us to do business, to network, to come here, to grow businesses, to survive, and do all the things that we do. And so it's pretty important. And it's, a, it's, it's the most amazing machine in the universe that we know of. Now, there may be something more, but we don't know about it yet. If you think of 15 billion years of evolution, the brain is the end product. The human brain is the end product of 15 billion years of evolution in the universe that we know of at present. And you've already got one. So that's good, isn't it? If we had to deliver the brains, it'd be a much more messy talk than it's going to be. So, so if you think of it as hardware, a necktop computer. I remember I was doing some work for IBM, again, uh, in, in Europe in the 80s. And um, well, the exciting time at these three conferences in Monte Carlo where they were putting all their executives and their executive customers through these big conferences. Um, was you know, up until then, computers had been these big, huge machines with people in white coats, and I don't know, you wouldn't remember this. There's, you know, there's wires under the floor and air conditioning, you know, uh, wheels are turned around and punch cards and so on. And suddenly they had the personal computer, the idea that an individual could have their own computer. And this was the huge, shocking thing of these particular conferences at the time. And so once we talked about a, de a personal computer, a desktop computer, and I got the idea of, well, the brain could be a necktop computer. Because if you're teaching thinking, one of the problems you've got to solve is to come up with appropriate metaphors. We did six thinking hats. We did software for the brain. So I came up in, in the 80s with this idea of an, if the brain is a necktop computer, and it is, in fact, a very deeply digital environment. Each neuron is a processor, has inputs and processes outputs. So the brain is a, is a parallel processing system of 100 million uh, processes, very, very, very powerful. But the problem is we're very short on software. The software, the software that you're using right now to process this information is 2,500 years old. Now, I don't know what uh, your personal situation is or your corporate situation. Budgets are tight. I understand that. But is there anyone here who has not upgraded their desktop or their personal or their laptop or their smartphone software within the last five years. I'd be shocked if anyone put up their hand. Well, there was a time when people would have put up their hand. So, so in other words, here's a gentleman here. He's talking to his girlfriend. No, no I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's not a bad picture either, but she should put some clothes on. But anyway. <laughs> um, but, no, but the interesting thing about this, it's not a phone, is it? We used to think it was a phone. It's not a phone. This is a platform that can do all sorts of things because there's thousands of people out there writing software, and he's you know, using it intelligently. Now, there's all sorts of things. You can even find out what time the next tram is going to come in Melbourne. Amazing. You know, I've got one here in my pocket. You've probably all got one. Uh, incredible uh, software. And so if you, you, if you had this, but all you could do is just make a phone, my phone call, it wouldn't be that much fun. But it's the software, the wide variety of apps that you can use to get stuff done that makes it so fantastic. 
growing up, you know, we, we, we had a mate who was the great music collector. He spent all his money on his record collection. And he had thousands of records, everything. Every rock song that ever it was, and soul and blues and everything, you know, all the things that you grew up with, although I grew up with it anyway. And uh, he had something like 3,000 records. And about a month ago, he said to me, go out and buy an iPod classic, was it, or deluxe or special? I bought one, 200 bucks, said, give it to me overnight. He gave it to me the next day with 6,000 tracks on it. 6,000 tracks. And we used to just lend each other a CD or a cassette tape. Now you can give them a whole library. So it's extraordinary. It's the software that makes it interesting. Imagine um, that you had like an incredible sound system, and you probably do. You love music, fantastic sound system, every woofer, you know, and tweeter, and huge, you know, woof, 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 and so on. So your whole neighborhood knew about your sound system. But all you had was one Patsy Klein CD. Could you imagine? I mean, there's nothing wrong with Patsy, but I fall to pieces all day long. I mean, it would be, soon you'd be tired. So, so it, what makes it interesting is the software, the repertoire of music we have. And we have a broad software. We have all kinds of this kind of music when we want to party, or when we want to get in this mood, or Bossa Nova, or you know, Marla, or Prussian marching music. You, you name it, you can get anything you want. And now iTunes, $1.19 a, a track, you know, you can just get on there, hear something, and you've got it through those orange earphones, you know, within a couple of minutes. It's fantastic. So it's the software that makes the hardware. So here you are with this incredible necktop computer, you know, um, more powerful than any computer that we have at present on the planet or that we can foresee building at present. That's changing. There's a rapid, the gap is changing rapidly, but still, um, you know, way out in front. And yet you're using software that's 2,500 years old. So one of the purposes I want to do tonight, I think we've got time, is to, is to help you upgrade your software for your brain and to give you some software. It only takes one second to use once we program it in, and, and I can, we can program it in about 10 minutes. So, so remind me to do that because I don't want you to go without this software for your brain, okay? So where are we? So, um, so the, let's talk a little bit about the brain because it is what it is. It's, you know, it's not anything. It's a particular thing that is designed to do particular things which it does very well and therefore it obviously doesn't do other things very well at all. Um, the brain is essentially a patterning system. The brain doesn't think so much as it stores thinking in patterns of experience, which is a good thing because if we had to reinvent breakfast every day, life would be too tedious. Uh, you know, we wake up, so we just wake up, you know, if you wake up in the morning your brain sort of boots up. You know, it depends how much red wine you had last night or whatever. And, you know, you figure out who am I, where am I, and uh, pretty soon your brain starts to secrete thinking. And what it secretes is what we call a CVS. So I'm going to repeat that a few times, a CVS. Um, the brain, that's the main thing the brain, the first thing you get from your brain is a CVS. Then you get them all day long. And people that you meet, people like you've met here t this evening, their brain at any particular moment, such as now, is secreting a CVS. That's the purpose of the brain as an organ of the body. And then the last thing you do when you go to bed is your brain will give you that last CVS before you, you know, you switch off. We won't go into what happens after that. Um, so, so what's a CVS? A CVS is a current view of the situation. So that's the main purpose of the brain at any particular moment to allow you to have a current view of what you think the situation is right now. And if, if it didn't do that, it wouldn't be much use to us. If the brain didn't allow you to have a view of the situation instantly so that you would know what to do, even still deeply programmed into the hypothalamus, into a reptile brain, is uh, the f what my professor used to call the four Fs. Flight, fight, feed, and sex. And uh, these are hardwired into our hypothalamus. And then, of course, in the last 15 million years, we've had this big arms race, brain versus brain, and we've, this huge cortex has exploded, giving humans such an enormous brain, which makes it very difficult for childbirth. That's why human babies are born so prematurely, uh, just so they can get out and require so much attention for such a long period of time. Huge, enormous brain. And you've got one again, you've got one, but the software is 2,500 years old, and I think it's time you, we upgraded it, and I'll give you some. So this software I'm going to give you is in the form of a switch. Now, before I just uh, give you that, I'll talk a little bit about why you have the software that you have right now. Where did it come from? Why do you think the way you think right now? What, what uh, operating system are you using? Anyone know? Take a guess. 
Pardon? Yes, um, pretty much most of the wiring of the brain takes place in the first 18 to 36 months. It uh, uh, doesn't change that much after that. It does change a bit, and you can change, but not that much. And it's largely through imitation of whatever's around you. So imitation, our brains are very largely wired up. That's why we're lucky to have at least two parents. If we only had one parent, um, it would make things even slower. So, um, and of course we've got family and then we get to school and school has a relatively small effect but some effect and, uh, and, and so on and then, and then we're off. If you think of the brain like a, mal uh, you know, a page out of a Melway street directory, say you take the, the winds of Chapel Street page out of a Melway directory, so Chapel Street goes down there, doesn't go over there. There's a railway line that comes around there, there's some side streets that do that there, there's Malvern Road there's and so on. There's a river that runs down there. And so that's it. Um, it's in you know, it's why it's it's laid out in a particular way. So our own brain does the same thing. Your brain gets wired up in a particular way, and once it's wired up, that's pretty much it. Some changes can be made, but it's, but, but not that much really. The brain's the only organ of the body that starts off big, and gets smaller. When you're born, the brain has about the, uh, anything between ten thousand, around ten thousand times more neurons than we have now. But they're not wired up. They're not connected. But as this process we're talking about starts to happen, and the brain, you know, certain through repetition, patterns are very important, you know, a stimulus response, stimulus response, and that starts to happen. You know, you, get, you cry, you get some food. That start, so little pathways start to form. You know, Chapel Street starts to form. The, you know, these little things start to form. And after a while, when the brain is wired up, pretty much deep trenches, electrochemical trenches are dug networks are dug into the brain, all the neurons that didn't really get wired up just die off and then there's your brain. So that's great, that's good, that means we can live, that means uh, we can store thinking which can be triggered off and then we can use, we can cognize thinking patterns electrochemically and once we've done that we can recognize them. So let me see if we can demonstrate it. Anyone, anyone here plays tennis? Anyone heard of tennis? It's a game that they, do. sorry. Anyone? Who plays tennis? Did you put your hand? Okay, come out here. Thanks for volunteering. Give him a round of applause. It's an old army trick. If you say, can I have a volunteer? No one comes. What's your name? Oscar. Oscar. What's your first name? That's my first name. No. It's just a trick. <laughs> so it's just kidding. Okay. So, Oscar, thank you. So, come over here in the light so the camera can see how handsome you are. Okay. I'm going to get back over there. Sorry. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. So, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Just yell out the answer so the guys down the back can hear. How do you spell the word smoke? You know, like smoke a cigarette. S-M-O-K-E. Not bad. Not bad. Pretty good. Okay. How do you spell the word um, folk? Like old folks back home. Oh, F-O-L-K. Okay. What do you call the white of an egg? White. Very good. Okay. So Almost obvious. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so I just want to give you this as a small token to show that uh, risk taking does pay off, okay? <laughs> yeah, I'll write I'll write on it for you later on. So yeah, okay. Okay. So just before you go, um who thought yoke here? Okay, these are just the honest ones, my dear friends over here. But um who really thought yoke here put up your hand? Okay, so honesty is starting to spread. Okay, thank you. See, um, no, I just want to tell you, for these are the normal ones, okay? Because that's the way the brain's supposed to work. It's a patterning system. You form a pattern, you say smoke, you say folk. What do you call the white of it? I mean, you know that the white is the white or the albumum, but the pattern does the thinking for you. So these are the normal ones. I don't know what we're going to do with you, but... Yours was yelling in my... Yours was sending people It was, okay. So you're trying to claim... Claw your way back to normalcy, are you? Okay. <laughs> oh, well, nice try. Read that book, it might help. I don't know, okay. What, what did it have to do with tennis? Uh, that was just a trick to get you to come out, okay? <laughs> Say, I'm smarter than you at the end, okay? <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, that's uh, okay. Away, my son. Okay, thank you. Anyway, so you get the idea. It's just to illustrate the incredible power of the patterning system of the brain. Now, that's just a pattern built up over how many repetitions? One. We said smoke. We said folk, so that's the first repetition. Then we ask the question, what do you call the white of an egg? And very often, you know, usually people will say yolk. And that's what should happen, because that's the patterning system of a brain. Imagine a pattern built up over a whole morning, or over 10 repetitions, or a whole business plan, or a whole PowerPoint presentation, or a whole culture, 
or a whole family way of doing things. These patterns are so strong and so deep and so powerful that to escape from these patterns is really asking quite a lot. And these patterns are there, we tend to reinforce the patterns. We don't tend to have a pattern and then escape from it. And so one of the things when we teach thinking is to try to teach people to escape from the patterns that they have. And we're very, very good at reinforcing the patterns. And that's the software which we're currently using. It's called Logic. It's invented by the Greeks, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. About 25, you imagine these, I don't know, kind of nights like this, really. Maybe a little hotter in Athens. Uh, if you read accounts of this, there's some great accounts. The symposium is my favorite. These dinner parties, a lot of red wine, a lot of very raunchy gossip. And yet, at the same time, discussing really, really interesting issues such as thinking and such and, and so on. Some of, some of these concepts which have reigned, however, have done that in Western uh, civilization for 2,500 years. I think what actually happened, these books were buried for a while and then round about the 8th, uh, 10th, uh, ninth. Uh, century, uh, fresh translations of the Greeks came, eventually St. Thomas Aquinas, just at that time when the church was running Europe pretty much, uh, they invented the first universities, was starting to invent its uh, education system, and St. Thomas Aquinas discovered these Greek translations, brought them into the church, particularly Plato's concept of truth, that there is a, such a thing as truth. Now, if there's such a thing as truth, well, naturally, we have it. And so that allows you to just match information. Does it fit? If it does, it's right. And if it doesn't fit, it's wrong. Now, uh, what did we do to uh, people <laughs> whose information didn't fit? Well, we don't burn them at the stake today, but there was a time where it was, it was really, <laughs> really uh, severely dealt with if you had a point of view, a CVS, a current view of the situation, which didn't match the truth which was being spread by the church. I was in Amsterdam a couple of years ago. It was the second time I'd been there to see this. But there's, there's a several museums in Europe, but the one I went to there, and it's the Inquisition Museum. It's got all the actual machines that the Inquisition used to impose truth and to check whether truth was being adhered to or not. And the machines themselves are spine-chilling, engineered within an inch of their life. I mean, these are not thrown together. These are engineered pieces of equipment and machinery, but when you see what they're designed to do, it's like, whoa. Um, and, uh, and what's even more chilling were the meticulous records that were kept, uh, you know, as these uh, truth machines were, were doing their, their work. So fortunately, we've to some extent evolved past that, but still um, people in many situations are very severely dealt with if they have a CVS that doesn't line up with the truth. And so it's a very, very dangerous concept, I am right. Probably the most dangerous concept we have. Probably more humans have died as a result of that concept than any other concept you can think of. I am right, because if I am right, then all I have to do is impose my righteousness on you, and if I have a stick or a bomb or something like that, it can be, um, the consequences can be very severe. So I have a CVS at any particular moment, a current view of the situation. If I add to that thing a virus, a meme which says I am right. So not only do I have this point of view, but it's the right point of view. So the only thinking activity to me is to defend the rightness of my point of view. And that can keep me stuck in my point of view for a long period of time. And that's what I asked you those questions. Is that it, is that it there? No, it's all about me. Um, okay, so if you remember these questions at the beginning, when situations arise, can you instantly know how you feel about them? Yes. That's the brain giving you a CVS, of course. Do you find it easy to see the logical errors in the thinking of others? Mm, yes. Because if we're operating from the 2,500-year-old right-wrong system, well, naturally, I'm right that that makes you wrong. I'm going to have to point this out to you. Do you find it, uh, are you good at convincing others when you're right? Yes. An enormous amount of our time and effort in business meetings in politics, in politics, the whole, we, we use the Westminster system in our parliament. I mean, it's embarrassing. I don't know if you've seen it. I mean, I hope you've got better things to do than what's that on TV. But if you ever see, you see all the people on this side, and there's lawyers, brilliant people, and, you know, people of goodwill, people are working hard, but all of them, everything they say is right, and nothing these people say makes any sense. Everything they say is wrong, we're right. Meanwhile, all the people on this side are saying, no, no, we're right, and everything you say is wrong. And that, these are grown-ups. 
And that process is supposed to create a safe and a productive future. And we see around the world huge problems that need to be solved. Um, and uh, they just, needless to say, can't be solved through that system. So when we ask the question, should politicians think, should professionals think, should doctors think, it's a very, very serious question. Should we just have a point of view and defend it, or should we actually think? Now, if you have something, such as a motor car, a camera, you know, a point of view, you've basically got two strategies available to you. When you possess something, what are the two general strategies you have available to you? By the way, this is the audience participation part of it, okay. So you've got, you got, you got a point of view. What are the two options strategically? One is you can defend it, keep it, maintain it, perfect it, or you can exchange it, sell it, swap it, get rid of it, you know, and search for something else. So they're the two things. Uh, logic is very, very good at defending, maintaining, perfecting uh, a point of view. And everyone in this room is a black belt in logic. We don't need to spend any more time on that. And it's very useful. I mean, if you want to, if you have a stagecoach, it's very good for fault checking and perfecting. If you remove all the faults from a stagecoach, that will give you a perfect stagecoach. Won't give you a motor car. The kind of design thinking where we have to escape from a stagecoach and somehow find our way to a motor car is quite different. And that's the sort of thinking we're going to be talking about. So um, we, we're good at black hat thinking, at logic, at judgment, at defending the rightness of our CVS. Very, very slow. Take a position. Use your incredible brain power just to defend that position makes us a very slow thinker because the speed of thought has to do with how long it takes us to escape from our point of view to find a much better point of view. So if you can escape from your point of view, say, once a year, uh, and find a much better one, you'd be a much faster thinker than someone who can only escape from their point of view, say, once every 10 years. So, and so. so these questions I asked you in the beginning, satisfactory as it sounds, because our whole education system designed by the church and spread around the world with uh, missionary zeal, uh, um, centrally organized by Rome, into Australia about 200 years ago with rabbits and a few other things. And even today, we still send our kids to school, giving the impression that life is made up of right and wrong. Get the right answers and don't make any mistakes. Uh, it's, you know, it's hard to imagine how you could abuse a child more than to give them the impression that life is made up of right and wrong because everyone in this room knows it's nothing like that. Imagine you just have a book with all the answers in the back of the book. Something happens here, look up the answer, there it is. It's nothing like that at all. Things that used to work five years ago don't work now. Um, uh, the environment is changed. If the environment was stable, it didn't change, yes, you could use the logic system because it's uh, just your stimulus response. But if the environment's changing in a Darwinian sense, then we have to evolve our ideas. And evolve ideas requires mutations. And mutations, we cannot tolerate mutations in our education system. They call them mistakes and they're punished. I mean, I, I, I got off to a bad start, I was left-handed. And the nuns uh, used to not just hit you on the, uh, the knuckles <laughs> with the rulers, but they had rulers with a steel blade in them. And they went to the trouble of turning the blade to the steel part and hitting us on the knuckles. And I was probably, you know, I couldn't do too much because I was in, was in second grade, so I was about, I don't know, seven or something. And again, it sounds horrible now in retrospect, but they really believed they were doing the right thing. You know, you've got to be right-handed a lot. So if that's the beginning of your educational journey, you can imagine how things went downhill from there. And, uh, and we spend a lot of time at school. You know, we spend 10 years or more. I mean, a huge investment in our lifetime. We get very, very little out of it. Um, and so we have uh, people, we have executives on huge salaries, um, frightened to, make, to think, frightened. Why, why are executives on huge salaries, and they could be in the military, they could be in a boardroom, they could be in a monastery, they could be in an academy. Why are senior executives frightened to think? Frightened of making a mistake. And so it's not intelligent behavior to think in that setting. So leaders are not interested in change. Jack Welch told me he had to hide on the way up all of the skills he needed when he became chairman, otherwise he would never have got the job. How's that one? <laughs> Where do you get that at Melbourne MBA or Harvard MBA anyway? Um, uh, and uh, so it's a very, very, very serious problem. That's why we have the problem.
problems we have. Um, I've never found a, a business school anywhere in the world, and I've been looking for a long while. There may be one, but I haven't found one that teaches Darwin's theory. Darwin's theory, as certainly as we understand it today, um, is the most powerful theory, meaning fact, scientific theory, that we have in science. Scientific theory is means so overwhelmingly supported by evidence that it reaches the stature of a scientific theory. It doesn't mean theory as in the common usage of the word. Um, there, is, there is no theory that has more explanation power for what to do in a rapidly changing environment than Darwin's theory. It talks about the value of mutations and what you need to do. It can be taught in, uh, we teach it in the school of thinking, we can teach it in, you know, in a few hours. In an opera, not just to know about it, people know about it, I mean to actually use it in an operating sense in the boardroom, you know, in the marketing department and so on, so that you can compete with your competitors in a rapidly changing, shrinking, highly competitive market to get the result you want. I was with a big retailer, senior management the other day, I won't mention names, the, the, the highest of the management group, and they said we have two problems. One is uh, people don't come into our stores, they've got nearly 80 stores, and the other one is that people come in and don't buy anything. And I was waiting for the rest of the sentence, so this is what we're going to do. Nothing. Now that's not a growth problem, that's a survival problem. Uh, and uh, 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 so it's not that the knowledge doesn't exist, it's not that it can't be used, it's just that it's, there's no tradition for thinking, for using these things, in the business, particularly in the business culture. Is in science, uh, is in the arts to some, in a different way, but, but certainly not in building. It's all about it, you know, getting the right answer. Even in selling, I did my PhD in lateral thinking, it was the first one in the world, I did it on selling. And I was in New York at the time, so imagine that, imagine a cheeky Australian coming to America, the land of the salesman, and uh, you know, teaching them how to sell. And I challenged the American model of selling. The Ameri American model of selling is that the salesperson closes the sale. How do I know that? Because I had to gather all of the stuff that had been written about selling. This was 1979, 1980. And it first began to be written about in the 20s in America. I gathered all of the books, the tapes, the programs, the training programs. And I couldn't find any written a, a, a training system used in the American business um, environment that didn't have as the central idea that the salesperson closes the sale. Now, there are various variations, high pressure, low pressure, shake hands this way, look up there, look down there. But, um, but basically that was the central belief, the central idea. Uh, by the way, none of these books were written, most of them were written by r r r preachers. None of them were written by when I said I was going to do a PhD in selling, people laughed. A <laughs> PhD in selling. What is more important in business than selling? In business. Now, there are other important things in business, but what's, you know, if it's actually business, then what's more important than the transaction where a customer tra you know, swaps money for a product or a service? Shouldn't there be hundreds of PhDs in selling in case we can find out something about that that might improve? No, no. We know everything we know about selling. AIDC, attention, interest, desire, close. And that's so right that it can't possibly be improved on. So we don't even have an R&D department in our sales division. I've never found one company anywhere in the world that has an R&D department in their sales division. Just in case there's something we could learn about selling. And uh, so it's no surprise that we don't find out anything. So anyway, I'm getting all carried away and just had one gin and tonic, but it's kicking in. Um, so anyway... Uh, so I, I thought this needs to be challenged scientifically. And so, the, uh, as you probably know, lateral thinking is try to find the main idea, try to find the dominant concept, and then escape from it, and then look around, maybe find something else. Um, so, the, so I found the dominant idea in selling is the salesperson closes the sale. So that's the close, okay? Now, I was able to do a lot of research and prove that, and I'll, I'll, just, um, I'll just see if I can uh, get that now. Um, in, when a salesperson leaves the office, escapes somehow miraculously from the office and calls on a customer in order to make a sales call, when they come back to the sales manager, what's the first question that the sales manager asks? What? Had yeah, how'd you go? Meaning, to get the sale. To get the sale, to get the deal, to close the deal. What I call dishing your salespeople. Did you sell him or did you sell her? Does anyone have any? Does that make sense to you? Just indicate if you agree with that or not. 
Okay. If you've been in selling, you'll know that that's true. Um, I believe that single question is the greatest reason why uh, performance in salespeople, especially in America at that time, is so low. Um, the insurance industry at the time, which is practically now being legislated out of business, um, well, uh, we had the longest records for this going back to the 20s. And 65% of agents failed in the first 12 months. And 85% of agents failed in the first 36 months. And this has gone on. They did another study about seven years before I did my, my uh, PhD, and guess what the percentages were? The same. 65% of agents failed in the first 12 months, and 85% of agents, and they called it agent turnover, quaintly, as if that was some reasonable thing. Could you imagine a management that regularly lost 85% of its workforce and then allowed the people to, to get the impression it was their fault? put an ad in the paper, get the fresh young people in, put them through training, send them out in the field with a AIDC, selling philosophy or tool or strategy. Uh, they go out, they make a call, they come back, do you get the sale? No? Oh, you idiot. So I'll role play this now. What's your name? Kim. Kim. Okay, Kim, and your name? Georgia. So you can be Kim and you can be Georgia, okay? You with me so far? Good. Good. So you've made a sales call and you've got a no and you made a sales call and, call and you got a yes, okay? And I'm the sales manager, you come back, okay? So you come back to me. Cam, did you get the sale? The relationship's pretty strong. Did you get the sale? <laughs> no. Are you idiot? <laughs> now, they don't say that now, but if you've seen movies like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, or The Play, or Death of a Salesman, you know that they didn't. They certainly were saying that when I was doing this research. So I uh, will just do that again. Cam, did you get the sale? No. Oh. Oh, I see. Uh, Georgia, did you get the sale? I did. Hey, let's hear it for Georgia. Whoa, 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 ding, 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 ding the bell. Here's your sausages and your chicken and everything like that. How do you feel like an idiot? So, so, so I'm your manager. I'm getting paid to increase the likelihood that you could be successful in selling. How do you feel right now? Yeah, but, but, you, but you know what I'm talking about. That may be what you're doing, but the model that they were teaching salespeople uh, is that your job is to get the sale, and we know that because they asked the question that I asked. So if you were in that environment working for me, who was asking that kind of question every time you made a sales call, how would you feel? How do you feel like me making another call now? You do that three times, and you're like... And so you don't make any calls. And so that's what salespeople w were doing. Um, anything to avoid making a call. They would have, they used to have cards in those days, they now, it's all on computers, but you can reorganize all the customer contacts and move them around and put them in that graph or in that app or change that around or put them in geographical order or then change in alphabetical order. Then you can do some research and you can Google some stuff and make a PowerPoint presentation and listen to motivational tapes. And there's a whole range of things you can do to avoid calling on a customer. Yeah, that's why they have movies open during the daytime. I know because I see them there all the time. The sales is full of salespeople. <laughs> I'm not going there. I'm doing research, of course. So, um, so, so the thing is, it's not. It's just not intelligent behaviour. You make a call. You do this thing. You escape from the office. You make a call. You come back. And then people used to think that salespeople would get rejection from customers. No, they were getting it from their own sales manager. So now we'll role play. So we just change that one question. And we often did, we found that we just changed that one question, sales would go up by a factor of 10. That's why I started to get, um, he's got the ball, you know, comfortable with actually using that as time went on. So we'll same situation, different sales manager. Cam, did you make a call? I did. Good on you. Excellent. Georgia, did you make a call? I did. To shake women's hand, but it was certainly fun for me, I don't know about But anyway, so... So, um, so would you be willing to make another call now? Because yeah, I've, I've reinforced that behavior. Now, what happens when never in the history of the world, in any product or service, in any market, can you get anything else other than a mixture of yeses and noes? Now, I've offered a $100,000 reward, which has never been collected, so I'm offering it again here tonight, to anyone who can produce any evidence whatsoever that a salesperson closes a sale. And yet in America, and it's not so much in the new industries like IT and that now because they've grown up since this, um, but still in the car industry, still in some of the older industries, it's still the main uh, you know, uh, belief that salespeople... So it's been modified a little bit, it's not as tough, but it still shocks me all these years later how it's still being used. 
And if we want to go into a company, we, we'll say divide your sales force down the middle, you know, randomly, so you can have odd birthdays, even birthdays. This group, keep doing whatever you're doing to them, just keep that going. This group, what we call, my book was called New Sell. So put the emphasis not on the close, but on the start of the sale. You're talking about relationships there now. And uh, this group will outsell that group every time, no matter what the economic environment, any of the other factors are in the same, but that's what happens. Because why? It's a strategy. Strategy is about what you control. You control the start. The customer closes the sale. The customer closes the sale. You can influence that, and the biggest way you can influence is by checking them with an offer. And then we get into another whole thing. Anyway, so that was just uh, how I did my uh, lateral thinking in BVS, and, uh, and that's another. It's a book called One Bet Selling Word of Mouth Buy and Tell. If you leave your business card up here, I'll send you a copy of the Orange Book, X10, and the One Bet Book with my compliments. So you get two books. I'll just email it to you. There's no other follow up. I'll just give you the books with my compliments because of the incredible generosity. Um, uh, just in this little family group here. But I, I, no point talking about something if you can't get the information. And so ebooks now, what's it matter? It's just an email. Um, so anyway, so I've got to give you this switch. So the switch is CVS. What does CVS stand for? Great. That's what your brain's secreting right now and all day long, CVSs. CVSs, current views of the situation. Now you can either use logic to defend the rightness of your CV, uh, CVS, or you can or you can escape from it. So instead, so what we're going to use is a switch. Now a switch is a very simple but a very powerful model. What is it about a switch? There's lots of switches. He's got them on the camera. You've got them on your smartphone. They're on the wall. They're everywhere. Switches are everywhere. Um, uh, we've got a system. If you've got the truth, that's one position. And so if you've only got one position, all you can do is maintain it, defend it, keep it intact. But if you have a switch, what do you have? What do you got? Yes? But you've got a minimum of two positions. And if you have two positions, that opens up a whole new world. First of all, you can escape. You can escape from one position and move to the other position. So you have the kind, that's the, if you take one word away from tonight, because less than one word would be nothing, and that would kind of be disappointing. But if you take one word, uh, that's the word escape. That's what we mean by thinking, escaping from your point of view. Why? To find a much better one. So escape, escape, escape. Uh, you have change. Change is really important, especially in a Darwinian sense, in a rapidly changing environment. If you stay, if you don't change, you'll go backwards. You don't stay the same, you go backwards. So we must be able to change, and that means every day, all the time. And so if you have a switch, you can change from one position to the other position. So you have escape, you have change. And the last one, you have innovation. I throw that in because that's the buzzword of the month right now, innovation. If you've got a switch, you can go from the old position to a new position, so you can have innovation. So you get quite a lot of stuff, don't you, just from having a switch. So in this switch, the first position is the CVS. What does that stand for? Current view of the situation, which is the default position in your brain. At any particular moment, you're in the CVS position. If you flip the switch, we go from CVS to BVS. CVS to BVS. So say that now, that's the actual switch. CVS to BVS, say that. You can tell I had a military background, can't you? <laughs> okay. um, if the CVS is the current view of the situation in this particular brain software, what do you think the BVS stands for? Pardon? Better view, okay, good. And that's the one that we use. Why don't we say, sometimes people say best view. Wouldn't it be better to have go from CVS, current view, to best view of the situation? But why do we deliberately not use that? Yeah, yeah we have that one already. That's the right-wrong system, right? I'm right, assuming I'm the best. So I'm so right that all I have to do now is defend my point of view because it can't possibly be improved on, so I just defend it. That's, that's what black hat defensive judgmental thinking is. It's assuming that my position is so right that the only activity I need is to defend my point of view. But if we didn't think that, if we knew that we couldn't be right in an absolute sense, we'd be very interested in looking for a much better view of the situation. So it's open-ended. And that's what we want, we want movement. So I go from CVS, current view of the situation, and the difference between the two states is x10, it's decimal, multiplied by 10, so I try to multiply my CVS by 10, CVS x10, to look for a BVS, 
maybe I'll take 10 steps over here. And so if this is, now that I move over here, what does this now become? My, this becomes my new, it's the better, vest, the BVS, that's what got me here, but now that I'm here, and it's certainly a better view seeing you, uh, but now that I'm here, what does it now become? Which means there's another, yeah, and which means now I have movement, and in human thing, gets me back into the cameras. <laughs> you guys told, do not walk out of the thing. But um, uh, so so uh, CVS to BVS, and so we have movement, because humans can never be right. So I'm going to see if I can demonstrate that. I'm going to see if I can insult everybody in the room. It takes a lot of experience. You can usually insult one or two people, but to actually insult everyone in the room, you've got to know what you're doing. I'm going to see if I can demonstrate to you that no one in this room has ever been right on one single occasion in their entire life. Not even once, not even close. So, so I'm trying to undermine this whole investment we have in being right. If you, and if, I'll see if I can demonstrate it, but before I do, what, would, what do you think will be the instant benefit to you as a thinker if, you, if when you leave this, walk out that door, if you're able tonight, if, you know, you get this epiphany, this, you know, this, uh, this uh, tipping point, this uh, catastrophic change of view, and you no longer operate from the point of view that you're right. You can obviously be right enough to wake up in the morning, recognize your partner, find your way to work. That's quite an achievement for a lot of people. But anyway, um, find your way to work, remember how to get dressed and a few things. They're right enough, valid. But in, I'm talking about in an absolute sense where you're so right that all you really have to do is defend your point of view. If you could not have to operate from that point, point of view anymore, if you could operate from the point of view as, and I'm not I am right, but CVS to BVS, what are the instant benefits to you as a thinker? And there's quite a lot of them. Let's hear some of them. Someone said one before. What do you think are some of the benefits to you as a thinker if you don't have to operate from I am right all the time? Pardon? Yeah, okay, so that you would be, you'd be open to more solutions. You'd have an indefinite or an unlimited number of options because the one you've got isn't the best one. Georgia. Pardon? Yeah, you, be, you could be more present. You don't have to live in the past defending the rightness of that ancient point of view. You could actually open your eyes, see what's going on around, and use the actual information to form a better point of view. Now, we're never going to get the absolute rightness, but you, all you need is relative improvement, that's all. So more present, that's a good one. What's another benefit? Pardon? Critical thinking, yes. Um, it's a pity it's called critical thinking. Critical thinking today means thinking skills. We try to get it called something else because we're actually very good at critical thinking, <laughs> which is black hat thinking, which is fine, but we need to be go beyond critical thinking and do design thinking, do experimental thinking you know, do uh, lateral thinking and so on. But I know what you mean, that is the terminology to use now that does include all those things. We spent, we, the goal of the school of thinking when we started was to get thinking on the curriculum as a school subject. And I valiantly predicted at the time it would take six years, this is 1979. It took 27 years. But now thinking is the biggest trend around the world in education, teaching thinking as a school subject. It's on, in the Vels, uh, Victorian educational learning standards. Every kid in Victoria by law has to be taught thinking from prep all the way through to year 12 now is one of the five main streams. And other states and other countries are doing it. China's uh, training three million teachers to, uh, to teach thinking as a, as a skill, you know, and as a, as a curriculum subject. So, um, so yes, uh, so, um, so escaping from our point of view and moving to a BVS. That's what we're trying to do. So I did say I'd try one. Uh, the, what, what are some of the other benefits if you don't operate from I am right? Uh, you're more likely to improve. Because if you didn't, if you, in other words, if you weren't satisfied with the point of view you had, it's, it's okay, it's right enough, I'm using it, that's fine, we've used it for quite a while and it's, you know, it's been useful, but I'm not satisfied. So I'll spend 10% of my time upgrading it and then I'm more likely to find improvements and I, and, and I can do it at a much faster rate, yes. This is a big one. This was certainly a big one for me personally. Um, the amount of time and energy, our lifetime, that we devote to sp defending the rightness of our point of view takes up enormous resources and energy. You could free that up. If you didn't have to use that for, uh, for that, you could be more relaxed. You wouldn't have to worry so much. You know, you could be have a little bit more fun. So lots of benefits. Okay, see if I can do it. Imagine a tic-tac-toe grid, or we call it noughts and crosses in Australia, but uh, you can picture a, no a noughts and crosses grid, can't you, if you go like that? 
um, you play noughts and crosses. So there are nine squares. Suppose you fill a noughts and crosses grid with the numbers one through nine. So in, in any any random order, so with nine, seven, eight, three, two, four, five, six, one, something like that. So that's what we would call a valid CVS, wouldn't it? You know, it's, it's, it's a way that you could look at nine bits of information. That's just one of the ways. So suppose you could take the nine and move it over to there, put the seven down there, put the one back up there, and then that would be a different, separate, valid way of looking at those nine bits of information. So here's the question. With nine bits of information, how many different CVSs are there? How many, without ever repeating one, how many different ways could you rearrange nine bits of information without ever repeating an arrangement? There's a mathematical answer. Anyone know what it is? This is nine factorial, so you get the answer by going nine times eight times seven times six and so on. So the actual answer is 362,880 possible ways of looking at nine bits of information. So if you do assume that your particular CVS happens to be the right one, the one that is so right that it can't possibly be improved, would, would require such an extravagant feat of arrogance because there's over 300,000 to one that your particular CVS could not possibly be improved. So you'd be much safer saying, I've got a valid arrangement, my CVS works for me, the family's used it, the business has used it, the footy club has used it, society has used it, but <laughs> since there's 300,000 other possibilities, it might be worth spending 10% you know, of my time uh, looking for it. Because the funny thing is if you look, see. I'm certainly seeing another BVS over there. I mean, they're everywhere if you look for it. Um, so, and, and of course, uh, there's one company that does this. It's called, and they call it Google Time. At Google, by law, you can't do your job 100% of the time. You're only allowed to do your job, uh, I think it's 80 or 80 or 90, I forget now, 80% of the time. It's actually an academic model, which they brought from Stanford in, into, into business. You can do your job that you're paid for 80% uh, of the time, uh, and the other 20% of the time you can't do that, you've got to think outside the square. You've got to look for BVSs. And so if you go to uh, Mountain View, and it's certainly fun to do, you see a lot of very happy 23-year-olds walking around with their laundry being done, and they've got like every possible food known to man, and they've got kiosk where you can get speakers. You don't go up and fill out a form and say, I need new speakers. You just, I want some speakers. Yes, here, have them. So they go, if they, if they travel down from San Francisco, it takes about an hour and a half, the buses are all fitted out electronically, and they can plug in all of their gadgets and play. All these blissful 23-year-olds, you know, um, and, and when you see them doing Google, time, it looks like they're having fun, they're playing, they're messing around, but then they do Google Maps. So Google Maps pops up, then you bring that over into the mainstream and then you run with it. And um, that, So that's fine, isn't that fun, how sweet and how lovely. It uh, happens to be one of the two most valuable companies in the history of the world. And what's it, 15 years old or 20 years old or something? So, so it's not just a you know, it's a really good idea, and I can't tell you how many times I've told this story. Wouldn't you think their companies would be rushing out the next day and saying, okay, if we just do this one thing, do your job 80% of the time, the other, don't do that, look for BVSs, no. So, we're operating at such a low level of productivity, it's actually quite easy to multiply things by 10. So, CVS to BVS, so what I'm going to get you to do now is say that 10 times. If you want to download this software or upload it into your necktop computer, you've got to form a little cognitive pattern. And the way the military do it and the arts do it, and anyone who wants virtuosity, knowledge is easily just read a PowerPoint. But if you want virtuosity, you have to actually evolve your nervous system. And the way we do that is through practice, repetition, rehearsal. We once asked the Juilliard School in New York to tell us how many hours um, students would need to play various uh, instruments to get, you know, virtuosity. Not be world-class performers, but, you know, sit down and play songs. You hear them and go, wow, she can play the piano. Piano, 1,200 hours. Guitar, 150 hours. Violin, 1,600 hours. Trombone, 400 hours. And then we went a bit further afield, karate, 600 hours, juggling an hour and a half. So, so, um, <laughs> and I, I didn't play the better, but I did learn how to juggle. But the thing is, um, and that's in the military, you know, in the military, how do you teach what s soldiers what to do in the event of an ambush? An ambush is a really unfortunate situation to be in because obviously they've got, they're protected, they have the element of surprise, you're completely vulnerable. 
but there are drills that have been worked out from experience like that go completely against all your natural instincts. So, uh, and, but how do, so they don't just say, I could tell you how to do it in about 60 seconds. But would you actually be able to perform that with virtuosity under the highly emotional and counterintuitive um, circumstances of a real ambush? No. So what does the military do? Practice, 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 drill, 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 repetition, repetition, rehearsal. I used to think it was strange when I was first learning it that we actually rehearsed and laid ambushes in the afternoon that were going to be done later in the evening as a rehearsal. And so, because, uh, and that increases obviously the chance we can do it. So, if we're interested in virtuosity, not just knowledge, we have to get involved in practice. So, I'm going to get you to do now, and then we should wrap it up. Um, 10 repetitions of CVS to BVS. If you just do 100 a day for the next 10 days, it only takes a second to say CVS to BVS. Say CVS to BVS, say that. Okay, so it's a bit weird when someone asks you to do it, but it's not the end of the world. So say it again, say CVS to BVS. So just picture it as a switch. What it means is that the current view of the situation can never be equal to the better view of the situation. See if you can wrap it, that's the most fundamental law of thinking. I know because I made it up myself. The, the current view of the situation can never be equal to the better view of the situation. So CVS cannot be equal to BVS. Then if we want to give it some measurement, which is very useful in business and elsewhere, so we'll say in this particular software, the CVS multiplied by 10 equals the BVS. So we're looking to escape from the CVS sufficiently far enough away, not just escape from here to here and because, you know, logically we've taken one more step, but to completely escape quantum leap, order of magnitude, and then we get here, then we put on our, oh, I'm back, and then we put on our, our, our black hat, which we, and then we assess that BVS to see if it really is good or not. So we don't get rid of our black hat thinking, but by itself it's not enough. We need green hat thinking, we need design, we need uh, leaping, we need whole changes of scenarios so that we can, uh, and then we, then, we, of course, we assess the hell out of them. So, CVS to BVS, I want you to say that 10 times. Then you'll only have to do 90 more tonight before you go to bed. You don't have to do them kneeling down and things like that. If you do this, uh, be good sports and do this, I'll tell you something really interesting, okay? Give me time to think it up. Okay, so CVS to BVS, 10 times go. CVS to BVS, CVS to, it can be fun. Okay, CVS to BVS, CVS to BVS, CVS to BVS, to BVS. five more. CVS to be good, nice. CVS. A bit louder. CVS to be here. One big one at the end. CVS They probably think this is an Amway meeting in here or something like that. There's, it's nothing like that. It's not voodoo. It's not mind control. It's nothing, nothing strange. It's just like it's just like doing push-ups. It's no surprise if you, someone showed you a push-up. You say, well, that's not much. Yeah, but do a hundred of them a day, and you cannot possibly fail to change the design of your chest. It's not like it might happen, it might, you can't possibly fail. If you use what we in the School of Thinking call PRR, practice, repetition, rehearsal, you cannot possibly fail. But there's no tradition for that in business. If you go to a business training session, say it's an hour, uh, the hour will be spent with PowerPoint presentations and chat. If you go to a, an army training session, it'll be 10 minutes of PowerPoint and, and uh, 50 minutes of practice, repetition, rehearsal. And so when you do jump out of the plane, you can actually pull the, the ripcord as opposed to you know, just passing a written exam. So, so it's t uh, we've, we don't have that tradition in normal education. It's terribly important. Virtuosity. Not just know about things. I know that. Don't tell me that I know about it. Yeah, but can you do it? And can you do it with skill and with excellence? And therefore get that result that your competitor can't get because you can do it and they can't. And so practice. Forever. So do, um, do your CVS to BVS. Just try them for the next 10 days and I'll predict what will happen. You'll be working on something. It might be something personal with a friend. It might be in a bar, you might be trying to meet somebody, or it might be something at work, or you know, all the things that happen in life. And because you are doing the repetitions, it's in your short-term memory. That's where all the action is. We can know things, but if it's back in our long-term memory, we can't use it. And so you're doing this, and then you remember CVS to BVS. So you say, well, I don't know if this will work. Probably won't, but let me try. Let me look for a BVS just to get rid of this idea. And when you look and you find one, you do that twice, you'll own this software for the rest of your life. We still have people from GE from 20 years ago who just Google CVS to BVS and they find us again. So I heard your talk, went home, taught it to my kids, been using it all this time. So it's no longer something that might work, it's 
highly tested. You're all lucky you don't have to worry about it. But just don't believe me, test it for yourself, but don't just throw it away. So well, I want to see if this works and use your own rigor, test it and see if you can find BVSs. Obviously some BVSs are easier to find than others, but you look, you'll see. Okay, so um, are there any comments, any questions? We talked about thinking, we talked about slow thinking, defending our CVSs compared to speeding up our thinking by escaping from CVSs and looking for 10 times better BVSs. We talked about where we got the software from 2,500 years ago, the church, missionaries, and systems that now is. That's fine, it's good that we've got it, but by itself it's not enough. Okay, I'll re finish up with a quick story. Texas floods a few years ago. Terrible, terrible, terrible thing. The water's rising up. It's a local church. The minister's on the church. And the water's up to the level of the roof of the church. And it's a pretty, pretty bad scenario. A motorboat comes out. Reverend, climb aboard. We've come to save you. So he goes, no, don't worry about me. Go save the others. Uh, I'll put my trust in the Lord. So the motorboat boat took off. And now the water's up even higher. He's up near by the steeple. He's holding on. And another motorboat came out. Reverend, climb aboard. We've come to save you. Now you'll save the others. I'll put my trust in the Lord. So the motorboat took off. Now the water's up so high, it's up to here. He's hanging onto the top of the steeple, and a chopper comes over. They send down the, the noose, you know. Reverend, quick, climb aboard. We've come to save you. No, no, go save the others. I put my trust in the Lord. Well, the chopper takes off. The water comes up, and he drowns. And this, you know, this really pissed him off. And so he goes to heaven. He sees St. Peter. He says, I'd like an interview with the boss. So they arrange an interview, and he's up before the Lord. He said, Lord, what happened? He said, you know, all my life I've adored you and everything. And you went ahead and let me drown. So I can't imagine what happened. I sent out two boats and a helicopter. And the moral of the story, of course, is that God does help those who help themselves. You've got this most incredible machine, your necktop computer. You've got some extra software, CVS to BVS. The ball's in your court. Give it a go. Thanks very much. Bye. <laughs>